today. So uh, we are really happy to have Dr. Mitchell Lon with us here. Um, he is Assistant Professor of Medicine in Nephrology and Epidemiology um, um, of Nephrology, but Epidemiology and Population Health at Stanford University School of Medicine. Um, Dr. Lon combines his interests in sexual and gender minority health and technology uh, to design and deploy digital solutions to address issues related to participant engagement, recruitment, and retention. Um, Dr. Lon is the co-director of the study PRIDE, uh, a national longitudinal cohort study of sexual and gender minority adult health. And he's the co-principal investigator of uh, PRIDE.net, a national community engagement network focused on capitalizing uh, SGM, which is sexual and gender minority health research. He identifies himself as he and him. I'll uh, hand it over to you, Dr. Um, Lan. Thank you so much for being here and offering your wonderful lecture for us. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, Susan. It's really a pleasure to be here. I really appreciate the invitation and I'm delighted to speak with you with you all today. I'll get my slides uh, up. Hopefully people can see these. Um, and throughout the talk today, I'll be, uh, you know, allowing folks to please jump in with questions. Uh, I'll be pausing at various times to ask to see if there are any questions from the audience. And then additionally, people can put comments or questions in the chat box and we'll make sure um, that those get, get answered. There will be some sections that will be a little bit more um, interactive in which I, at that time I invite people to unmute themselves and share their perspectives or um, their opinions about about what's being presented. So again, really delighted to be here. Thank you uh, for the invitation and for that, uh, for that uh, great introduction. So a couple of disclosures, our work is funded by a variety of federal and non-federal sources uh, that I'm showing here um, and do a little bit of consulting uh, for some LGBT serving uh, companies, uh, but there is no other financial or professional conflicts of interest that relate to this presentation. Uh, these are the objectives for today's talk. I hope that by the end, people will be a little more familiar with some terms that relate to sexual orientation, sex assigned at birth, and gender identity. We'll talk about how people can uh, obtain uh, the pronouns that people use. As you, mentioned, as you heard from Susan's introduction to me, I use he and him pronouns. Some people use other pronouns, and it's an important way um, when you're interacting with clinical research participants uh, to show that you are welcoming and affirming. We'll talk about ways that you can actually inquire about sexual orientation and gender identity in sensitive ways, both verbally, in person, on the phone, or using forms. And then we'll spend a fair amount of time talking about it, creating a, 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 an affirming patient-centered environment for LGBTQ people that includes training forms and environmental changes like science and symbols. So this is really going to be the, the overview. We will um, there's a lot of information. I'm happy, of course, to share the slides um, and the and the recording with with everybody uh, after, so that folks can refer use them maybe as a little bit of uh, of a reference uh, in your future work. So a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Mitch. Uh, as you heard from Susan, I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Medicine uh, in the Division of Nephrology. So I'm a nephrologist, a kidney disease doctor. I do very little kidney disease work. I sometimes call myself a nephrologist light in that I uh, do about four to six weeks per year in the hospital for patients who are hospitalized with kidney disease. And then I'm also a primary care provider. So one day a week, I see patients in Stanford's relatively new LGBTQ primary care program where I see exclusively LGBTQ people. Um, and I identify as the gay cisgender man. And so cisgender means that I uh, identify, that I have a gender identity that aligns with the sex that I was assigned at birth. So I was assigned to male sex at birth and I identify as man today. Uh, so, and most of my time, actually about 75% of my time is con done conducting LGBTQ health related research and, uh, and, and health disparities work. So some, this talk today oftentimes focuses on things that are sometimes described as cultural competency or cultural humility. And so 
uh, you know, one of the things that we oftentimes talk about is, is what is cultural competency. And so competency is really the idea of being welcoming, respectful, and responsive to a particular group. And that's usually done through knowledge or training, which is some of what is going to hopefully happen today. But then there's on the on the on the kind of the similar spectrum, there's culture of humility, which is this process of ongoing uh, personal reflection and growth that allows you to continually increase your awareness and be a little more uh, responsive and uh, and, um, and 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 aware of the various communities that you may that you may interact with. So to start this talk, I usually talk about a health disparities model that we use um, rather frequently in our work, and that is this model here, which is that there are both um, stigma that happens between people, so people be are stigmatized uh, from by, by others, and people can also be stigmatized by by structures that exist. So that might be policies or laws uh, that uh, they create stigma. That eventually leads to people feeling uh, what we call intrapersonal stigma or stigma within oneself because they feel they feel like they're to blame for a lot of the problem, the, the stigma that they've experienced in society. That can lead to a variety of uh, downstream effects like stress, anxiety, and depression. And that's one of the ways that we believe that a variety of healthcare and health disparities and inequities uh, result. So I like to kind of frame the talk with that and think about the difference between equality and equity. And people may have seen an image like this before. Um, uh, this has been floating around on social media for many years where equality is where everybody gets the same number of boxes and equity is where um, people with different experiences get a different number of boxes. We use actually a little bit of a different model um, in, in, our, in our work, and that's this model here. So the first thing when we're looking at equality is that still everybody is getting one box to stand on. It's equal, right? But some folks are actually on a lower ground here. The goal is to see over this fence to see the baseball game, or you can think about that as as being analogous to participating in research that you know you have to um, that there are a variety of barriers or obstructions to for people to, to participate in research and so some folks like the person here in yellow is literally on uh, on a lower ground and that can be a result of uh, of historical oppression that various communities have faced including the lgbtq community some folks also have a higher fence to see over and uh and so that can be the current systems of oppression that prevent people from participating in research and so even though these people are uh, are different they're different they actually are at different heights different colors etc they they their difficulty in participating in research and pregnancy and they were in this case in seeing the baseball game is primarily due to the context that's around them rather than things that are inherent to themselves and so equality again giving the same box to it's one box to each person versus equity giving uh, extra numbers of boxes to certain people so that everybody can participate. In this case, everybody can see over the fence um, and can see the baseball game or can participate in research. And so the, these extra boxes are the extra work that we um, in the research world need to do in order to welcome um, LGBTQ people. So ideally, we want to get rid of the fence completely so that um, so that we can welcome everybody. And this is the really the justice model um, is getting rid of the systems of oppression to welcome everybody fully. This is obviously takes a lot of work uh, and is oftentimes outside the scope of much of our of our jobs, but it is um, you know a possibility uh, as well. So just some key points from this initial section is that underrepresented populations, including LGBTQ people, both face um, both historical and present systems of oppression that make participation in their healthcare and participation in research difficult. And so the equity-based model, which is what many of us try to focus on, recognizes that and devotes extra resources to welcome uh, folks um, who may be vulnerable, while the justice-based approach is works to eliminate all systems of oppression to really per, per, uh, to permit participation by, by everybody. All right, so in the next section, I'd like to discuss some terminology and many folks may be familiar with a lot of these terms and other folks may not be. So I hope this is, um, you know, a uh, uh, useful and we'll pause at the end of this, uh, at this next section to, 
to ask uh, or to you know answer any questions that you might have about about terms because I think that that's uh, you know an important aspect. So, um, so many of you may have heard of the terms of LGBT and Q for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer, but there is also the uh, larger eco academic term of SGM or sexual and gender minority people. And so, a sexual minority person is somebody who is not straight, somebody who's not heterosexual. And a cisgender person is somebody uh, who, whose gender identity aligns with their sex assigned at birth. So as I mentioned before, um, somebody, you know, I'm a cisgender person. I have, I was assigned male sex at birth and, uh, and I currently identify as a man. And, um, and so really a gender minority person is somebody who is not cisgender. So that includes our transgender uh, folks, but also gender non-binary people and a slew of other identities. And so because um, there's continued uh, amount of, of letters that have been added to the, to the alphabet, people may have heard of LGBTQQIA. It's very confusing because there's lots of identities that are now included in that long acronym that medicine and academic medicine in particular uh, developed this term of sexual and gender minority people. And so SGM is this really umbrella term to describe that in this entire population, which are very diverse and dynamic. And so I use the terms LGBT, LGBTQ, LGBTQ+, and SGM really interchangeably throughout there, but you can always recognize that I um, uh, am, am using that in terms of the entire, the entire umbrella. So when we think about terms, there are really three foundational areas. And the first one is gender identity, sex assigned at birth, and sexual orientation. And we'll go through each of these individually. And one of the first things to, to really clarify and to make sure people are aware of is this is the difference between sex and gender. And this oftentimes gets conflated um, in many of the papers that we read and lots of the work that we do may be conflated in many of the case report forms that you use in the work um, uh, conducting clinical research. And so, uh, I, uh, I want to talk about the way that I typically and that the way that the SGM research field typically uses this. And so the first thing is sex is really the biological and physiological characteristics that define male and female. So usually this is done by looking at uh, external genitalia when you're born, either by the OBGYN doctor or the pediatrician that's delivered you. And uh, they make a determination and that um, is oftentimes how sex is determined. Of course, there are other ways that sex can be determined as well, including chromosomal makeup or even hormone levels or a variety of ways that that can happen early in um, in somebody's uh, uh, somebody's life, and that's different than gender. Gender is uh, is a um, set of socially conduct constructed roles or behaviors of, about um, the you know in society, and that uh, we typically use the terms man and woman uh, for gender terms, and male and female for sex terms, and so. Uh, just to think about that uh, that way. And it gets a little bit, um, I like this graph, it's a little bit uh, hokey, but it's also, I think, effective in that this is um, a unicorn who has both a gender identity. Again, that's, you can see the rainbow uh, kind of thought bubble, and that's how somebody identifies in their, in their head. Uh, and that can be on a more man or woman or masculine or feminine spectrum. And then that's, that can differ from somebody's gender expression, the way that they express their gender. And that's the clothes we wear, our hair, makeup, et cetera, that are oftentimes associated in society with things that are typically masculine or typically feminine. And then that can and all, of course, all of those can be different from the sex that they were assigned at birth. Again, uh, typically using terms like male or female. And so uh, all these things can be present in people. You can see that they're, they're dynamic, they're on a range, they're on a slider, they're not necessarily fixed things and they can change over time. And so this is uh, one way of thinking about, about gender identity and gender expression as it relates to, uh, to sex assigned at birth. Um, and so some of the terms that we use to describe gender identity are terms like uh, transgender, which people uh, may be familiar with. So this is um, also used as an umbrella term. It just, again, describes somebody whose gender identity differs from the sex that they were assigned at birth. And it's, it, um, it can also be used to describe people who have a gender outside of man and woman. There are more than just two genders. Um, people can have no gender, people can have multiple genders, et cetera. And we 
you don't use the terms, although you may, and I'm curious to in our conversations later, if you're seeing these terms um, from industry or in case report forms, things like transsexual, male to female, female to male, these are terms that we end up doing, we not don't use anymore as they um, are actually quite offensive to, to the community. And so some of these terms are things not to use. And we don't use transsexual because you're not changing your sex, you're, um, it's your gender that has changed. Um, and then male to female and female to male, those are all sex-based terms, right? Again, male and female. And those are actually emphasizing people's prior identity rather than their current identity. So we tend to use, um, uh, you know, uh, things like uh, trans men and trans women, and we'll talk about those terms a little bit later. Cis, as I mentioned, is for people who are not transgender, and most people in the world identify as cisgender. And so this actually comes from organic chemistry for those who have taken it. Uh, cis and trans molecules, uh, you can see that the cis meaning on the same side and trans meaning on the meaning on the opposite side. So these are different confirmations of organic chemistry molecules um, is how the cis and trans terms have come about. There's also an identity called gender queer, which is an identity used by some people to uh, to describe their, their identity outside of the typical dominant norms in society or, uh, or beyond genders. Um, and then I wanted to, in the same time, uh, talk about intersex, which is um, a, a, a really a, 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 a term that can be used to describe a variety of, uh, of uh, chromosomes or gonads or genitalia that don't fit the typical male and female definitions. For some people, intersex is an identity, and for other people, it is not. Um, and just to note that this is not related to sexual orientation or gender identity. And a lot of people who are intersex, um, and I've given some examples of some of the, uh, some of the medical conditions uh, that folks have like congenital adrenal hyperplasia or androgen insensitivity syndrome. A lot of these folks have gotten really unneeded, needless surgeries in infancy and in attempt to, nor to normalize their, their sex. Um, and that can be, uh, and they're oftentimes assigned a gender to grow up with, which may not be the, the gender with which they actually identify. And again, um, the old term not to use here is hermaphrodite. Uh, and it's a term that is, uh, of course, very offensive and one that should not be used. Um, this uh, is actually the intersex pride flag shown at the bottom here. And there are a variety of, of flags and symbols, which will be important later in the talk. I'd like to move on to sexual orientation, and I think this is a term that many people are a little bit more familiar with, but I would like to point out that sexual orientation is actually made up of uh, really three different components, the, or the identity component, you know, I mentioned that I identify as a gay man at the beginning of my talk today, and so that's part of my identity, but then there's also attraction and behavior. So what are the genders of the people that I'm attracted to, and what are the genders of the people that I'm having sex with? Those are the kind of three, three components that go into sexual orientation, attraction, behavior, and identity, and they may be, um, they may be different. Right, they may not. They just because somebody identifies as one way, it doesn't mean that they're necessarily attracted to the same group of people, and maybe actually having sexual behaviors that are different. And so, again, to kind of expanding the gender unicorn component here, um, that there's um, you know various uh, genders that people may be attracted to, which may be different from the folks that they may be even emotionally or romantically attracted to. So all of these things, all five of these things, gender identity, gender expression, sex assigned at birth, and then sexual orientation and its components are present in all of us all the time. And so some of the terms that people are probably more familiar with related to uh, sexual orientation include terms like lesbian and gay, which people know, um, bisexual and relative, um, you know, and pansexuals are a kind of a newer term on the block. And so bisexual used to um, really refer to, uh, was back in the day when we thought that there were only two genders of man and woman. And now we know that there are many genders. People may have no gender or may identify with multiple genders at one time. And so instead, uh, pansexual is a term that has come out to describe the fact that they, that uh, people may be attracted either romantically or sexually to people of more than one gender at any at any time. 
And that can vary, of course, uh, over time as well. Uh, people may have also heard of the term queer for folks who are, who are of my generation or older. This was probably a, ter a term that was viewed as rather offensive. Uh, it was used derogatorily. It's been actually kind of reclaimed by the, by the community broadly. And this is uh, another umbrella term that can be used um, to describe sexual minorities and gender minorities broadly. And then same gender loving is a, is a label that's used uh, typically among the African American communities and represents a unique African American perspective of, of, uh, of LGBTness uh, that's important. And then asexual is another sexual orientation that doesn't get a lot of uh, a lot of airtime. And this is a sexual orientation of not having feelings of sexual attraction. Um, and again, this is an orientation which is different from celibacy where people make the choice not to have sex. Um, and in fact, many asexual people still have romantic attraction to other people and, and they do actually still have sex even though they might not necessarily um, have a lot of sexual attraction. They may still have romantic or emotional attraction. So, you know, I guess the, the, you know, the summary of this point, and I'm going to show a quick video here in a moment that helps drive home some of the points as well, is that all of us have a gender identity, a sex assigned at birth, and a sexual orientation in us at the same time. And we use a variety of labels um, to describe those terms, and some of those terms are shown here. And so... Um, and so for the first one, a lesbian transgender woman, I just want to talk a little bit about what that means. So, so this person is a transgender woman. That means that they were assigned male sex at birth. They currently identify as a woman. And the lesbian means that they're attracted to other women. So this is somebody, again, who was assigned male sex at birth, currently identifies as a woman and is attracted to other women. So that makes them a lesbian transgender woman. That's regardless of the organs that they've had, whether they've had any transitioning, whether they take hormones as part of their transition. Um, uh, you know, uh, and so there's, uh, you know, this does not necessarily deal with what anatomy people have. And that's, a, these are all identity-based uh, uh, terms. All right, so I'm going to show a quick two minute video that I think kind of illustrates many of these uh, items and um, it may be choppy over zoom, but I hope the audio at least will be uh, will be sufficient. Here we go. Now you will watch a video about gender. The video is audio described for people who are blind or have low vision. In a classroom, two people present. We're going to take two minutes to talk about gender. Oh, this has nothing to do with me. Well, actually, gender does have to do with you. Not to me. Hold on. Everyone has a relationship with gender. But... Whether you've thought about gender a little or a lot, it has impacted you. How you were named, what clothes you wear, expectations about what jobs you can do. And you get the point. Yep. Every single person watching this video has been taught about gender from the very beginning, from birth. We like to define people, right? So when people are born, society defines them by looking at their reproductive organs and labels them male or female. It's a girl! Well, actually, it's more complicated than that. Gender can be broken down into gender expression or gender identity. Let's look at some gender identities. I'm Sophie, and I'm cisgender. The majority of people in our world identify as cisgender, sometimes without us even knowing it. Cis means I identify with the gender I was assigned at birth. When I was born, the doctor said, It's a girl. And I still identify as a woman today. Hi, I'm Tamara. I'm also a woman. So when I was a baby, Man holds a blue blanket. Uh, it's a boy. Tamara pulls um, away the blanket, revealing a pink one. No. I'm a trans woman. I identify as a woman even though when I was born, I was assigned something different. A man who is deaf signs. I'm Garrett. I'm a cisgender man. When I was born, everyone said, People throw blue balloons. A boy! <laughs> and today, I identify as a man. Hi, I'm Bailey. People surround Bailey with pink. And I'm also a man, even though I was assigned female at birth. People tear away pink to reveal blue. I'm a trans man. Hi, I'm C. Hi, I'm Lindsay, and we're non-binary. For me, that means I don't identify as either a woman or a man. C and Lindsay are handed multicolored balloons. And for me, that means I don't identify with a gender at all. Lindsay tosses balloons. Okay, but I'm confused. I mean, what about gender and sexuality? Oh, I know. Um, sexuality is about who you're attracted to. Yes. So are you gay? Nope. 
Gender and sexuality are both part of our identities, but they're completely different categories. So don't assume someone's sexuality based on their gender. Now let's dive into gender expression. Let me ask you something. If you're a cis man, do you need a plaid shirt, bulging muscles, to have no room for tears? To love sports? Man is thrown a football. No. Man misses football. This might work for some and not others. Why? Because there's no one way to express masculinity or femininity. That's for you to decide. Everyone's allowed to have their own relationship to gender. But there are different things that may affect how the world views your gender. Or how you choose to express it. For example, makeup. Do you wear it? How do you wear it? How colorful do you make it? Hair, is it short, is it long, more natural, braided? Did you shave it all off? Clothes, do you wear skirts, pants, both? Do you accessorize? Body language, how do you walk, how do you sit? A person signs. All of these things can be expressions of gender. You might express your gender differently at different points in your life. For example, do you dress differently than you did as a middle schooler? Photo of a middle schooler in a yearbook. Uh, thankfully, gender expression can evolve as you grow as a person. Whew. Bottom line, you understand your identity better than anyone else. No matter how you identify, you deserve to be believed and respected. So I hope that video was helpful to, to summarize a little bit of, of some of the terms that we've discussed today. Um, I would like to point out there is no single definition of the terms that I presented today. These are, that's universally accepted. These are some of the commonly accepted definitions and these actually vary over time and they vary within a person and they even vary by geography. So. I've been doing LGBT health work for about 16 or 17 years, and the terms that we use today are a lot different than the terms that we used previously. And I think I would always uh, encourage people to avoid attaching labels to people and instead ask people what terms they use and use their use their own their own language. Um, I did want to spend one slide just on coming out. This is the process of self disclosing your sexual orientation or gender identity. Um, this is the ongoing process for many people and people it's important to know can be out to some people and not out to others and so you may have um, research participants or patients that come out to you but may not be out to others in the healthcare system may not be out to others um, in their in their lives into their family members etc um, and so this is um, and also it's not always associated with better outcomes actually coming out in some cases is associated with worse health outcomes and worse uh, both physical and mental health outcomes and then um, many people um, think about, um, you know, transitioning genders and that, that sometimes involves surgery or sometimes involves hormones. And I would like to point out that there are really three different types of transition that we frequently talk about. One of them is social transition. So this can include things like using a new name, um, using uh, what, you know, changing their pronouns that they use, or of course their gender expression, how well they, what they appear uh, to be to other folks. So how they look, clothing, uh, makeup, mannerisms, etc. Some folks undergo medical transition, which includes uh, the use of hormones, uh, other medications, uh, and then other uh, things to change their, their appearance as well. So things like injectable medications or fillers to to change their, their face or other parts of their body. And it can also include vocal coaching where people can change the pitch of their voice because a voice pitch is one of the ways that um, includes uh, how we express our gender um, as well. And then of course there are surg surgical transition, which um, there's now more than actually probably more than 35 now different procedures or surgeries that can be done um, to help people affirm their, their gender. And it's important to know that some people go through none of these processes and some people go through all of them and there's no path that's defined. For example, some people may have surgery early in the process, even before they start hormones, while others may be on hormones for a while. Some people may never do hormones. Some people may just have surgery. Some people may never have hormones or surgery and just change the way that they, um, that they just change their gender expression. So those are, there's no really um, set defined path. So from this section, there are 
um, some key points, which are that gender identity and sexual orientation are different concepts and that somebody's gender identity, again, the gender with which they identify may differ from the gender that they express, their appearance, how they look, etc. And that sexual uh, behavior and sexual attraction that people that, that people have sex with and that they're attracted to may differ from their own identity. There was a rather famous study in 2010 of of um, men who identified as straight in New York City and substantial proportions of them were having sex with uh, exclusively with men and other folks were having uh, sex exclusively uh, with women and a large percentage of folks were having sex with both. So it's just important to recognize that behavior attraction and identity may actually be different. And then the last thing is about labeling and it's best to really use the words that participants use themselves to describe themselves um, rather than you deciding uh, which term or terms to use for folks. So I'm gonna pause here for a second and see if there are uh, any questions that folks have about what we've discussed so far, which is you know largely terminology and a little bit of the model that we use for health disparities. Folks can either um, put them in the chat and you can continue to put questions in the chat throughout uh, the presentation today if you joined after the beginning um, and or folks can feel free to unmute themselves. And so I'll pause for a second to see if folks have any questions at this moment. <laughs> All right, so let's continue and move on to discuss a little bit about LGBT communities and some of their health disparities. We frequently get asked how many people in the world are LGBT? Uh, and the short answer is, is that we don't know for sure, uh, but we, we do know in the United States from, um, from, the, from Gallup at least, which does random digit dialing, uh, uh to to folks across the country uh this is data from 2020 which was uh, released in 2021 that about 5.6 percent of the united states identifies as lgbt you can see um here that that is mostly uh folks who are identifying with the bisexual label but really there are um you know large numbers of really many of these of these groups and so this was um done with by gallup as i mentioned by uh, phone calls that they had made to folks across the country using um randomly uh selected digits and this i think is a is an important uh uh slide because this looks at the percentage of these populations based on what year they were born. And so folks who are younger, clearly 15.9% of Generation Z identifying as LGBT or one in six people. Um, and this is not that there are more LGBT people uh, in more recent years. It's just that society has changed where folks are comfortable being out and comfortable answering um, to questions that are uh, proposed by Gallup, uh, you know, when you get a random phone call from somebody that you've never met before to ask you questions about your about your identity. So, um, and you, so you can see that as time has passed, as people are getting older, uh, the oldest group of the traditionalist people born before 1946 have a, a small proportion of the folks who are out as LGBT were uh, in the baby boomers that increased, that increased again in Generation X, even more in the millennials, and then even more in Generation Z. So um, that is the the current aspect. Um, and then when we look at, um, at the SGM population, um, there are, um, we also look at race and ethnicity, et cetera, and you can see that there are, uh, you know, that SGM status is not unique to a particular race or ethnicity. And we also know that it's not unique to a particular socioeconomic status, uh, et, et cetera, or education level. So uh, that is, um, you know, part of the part of the the uh, the process, and so we know that SGM people really are are everywhere. And so, if we harken back to the health disparities model that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, I did want to 
um, just focus on that that stigma at the beginning that happens both from an intra interpersonal so between two people two or between you know one or more people and uh, and structural stigma stigma that relates to laws or or policies and so you know I think an important aspect of the history here is that uh, homosexuality was in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders until 1973 as uh, as a diagnosis as a diagnosis and gender dysphoria actually remains in the DSM today. And back in the in the um, in the late 90s and early 2000s, during the height of the Human Genome Project, there was also the hunt for the gay gene or hunt for the trans gene. This was, you know, at one point thought to be just a mutation that could be fixed genetically. Uh, clearly, that's uh, not the case, and this work was very damaging to folks. And then um, folks may be familiar with what's called conversion therapy or reparative therapy. This is um, typically done religious organizations and it's um, uh, thought, you know, was originally uh, proposed that you could kind of, uh, you know, to cure yourself of homosexuality or of, uh, of an LGBTQ identity. These are typically, as I, done, as I mentioned, done by religious organizations and have largely been, um, you know, ha have shown to be nothing but harmful. They're outlawed in, in many states actually across the country. Um, I think the important aspect for many of us and the folks on this call, including, you know, for folks who are researchers and work in the research space, is that LGBT people have had horrible experiences in healthcare. So looking at the green and the blue bars here for LGB and transgender people, I'm not going to go through them individually, but you can see that they're in these four different uh, charts here that LGBT people have had horrible experiences in the doctor's office, that they've uh, been blamed for their healthcare status, have been abused either physically or verbally, um, and have had really negative experiences. And so this really impacts people's participation in research. Why would you go to a place where you are going to be discriminated against and feel, um, you know, like you're to blame for your problems? And so, um, you know, people avoid the doctor's office. They show up with really late presentations of diseases and they get invited to clinical research studies and they do not participate because it requires them to come back to our spaces, which are, um, you know, oftentimes pretty, pretty discriminatory or places that they've had bad bad experiences so this is some history that i think is important for for everybody involved in healthcare and clinical research to to really know about that it's this is what you're you're trying to change and trying to tackle this was a very large study of transgender people done in 2015 and the orange bars here you can see that a third of transgender people have had a negative experience with their healthcare provider in the past year and, um, and, a, and on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side, a quarter of folks have um, not seen a healthcare provider in the past year because of fear of mistreatment. And you can see that this is, um, happens across all races and ethnicities. So, um, and thanks, Siggy, for your, for your comment uh, in the chat box, which is that, yeah, people have definitely, providers have dismissed people's concerns or, um, you know, just kind of discredited uh, patients for their, for their, for their, their comments uh, and for their questions and for, the, you know, addressing their healthcare needs that they actually have and kind of blow them off or brush them off. And so there's, um, there's lots of, 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 of major issues. That is definitely true. <laughs> And so, um, and you know, part of this is relates to the structural component here, which is, uh, this is, uh, uh, this is a, an organization called the Movement Advancement Project, or you can get to them from lgbtmap.org, and they have maps about a variety of policies related to LGBT uh, people. It can be healthcare, it can be employment, it can be education, health insurance, lots of, lots of different things, but this, um, uh, what they've done is they've tallied the policies in each state um, to be whether they're pro-LGBT or anti-LGBT. And so the dark green boxes like California, uh, or dark green states like California, are the states that have the highest uh, pro-LGBT policy tally. The middle uh, states are the are the uh, are the orange uh, ones. The low policy tally is the the kind of the pale, I don't know, tan, I guess, or beige. And the states that are negative, that have more negative policies than pro policies are the red states. So uh, you can dive deep into each of the states and see exactly what the policies are and get different maps from healthcare. But you can see that there are um, primarily the West Coast um, 
uh, and the Northeast are the most pro uh, LGBT places. And that's where a lot of LGBT people live as well as um, of course, Minnesota and um, in Illinois, Chicago, especially is where uh, you know, lots of LGBT people live. So there's lots of components here, which I think are important to think about. Um, and so if we move into some of the healthcare disparities um, that in this, I've just picked a selection of them. Um, this again, this is the downstream effects of the health disparities model. I'd be remiss not to talk about, about the HIV epidemic. And of course, this um, is something that, you know, uh, disproportionately impacts uh, the sexual and gender minority community. Uh, these are some famous images back from, from, uh, from in the 80s. And, you know, what happened, uh, part of the, another part of the history here, again, in terms of research, is that um, it required significant amounts of activism from the LGBT community um, to get any research and to get support from federal, state, and local governments. And so uh, folks were, um, you know, really met with, um, you know, kind of apathy to LGBT people and HIV. They did not get any of the support. Um, if you know, money is for research, money for treatment, money for prevention, and money for support was uh, typically neglected. Um, and so instead, the community needed to self-organize. Uh, organizations like ACT UP, which you may have heard of, is this very famous silence equals death uh, here at the White House. And there are many t-shirts and other uh, things that were uh, done at that point, as well as um, activism at the NIH and activism in various other places as well. So, um, you know, so this history of being neglected by both the federal government and the medical community broadly um, is still rings uh, true and is in many people's people's memories, folks participating in research. One of the biggest health disparities in the LGBT community is actually smoking. Uh, so LGBT people smoke two thirds more than the general population, one in three LGBT people compared to one in five of the general population, um, taking significant years off of our life and, um, and uh, spending of course, lots of, lots of money. Um, and it turns out um, when the big tobacco uh, files were kind of unearthed in the 90s and 2000s, we learned that there was actually a project from the big tobacco companies that targeted uh, targeted LGBT people and targeted some uh, some other groups. And I think in more, even in more recent years, we've seen ads like this uh, from the tobacco industry that are, uh, you know, very pro pro LGBT, pro marriage equality, pro um, pro support uh, that um, you know, that uh, are clearly directly marketing um, to the LGBT community. And so I want to um, share another video that deals with um, with LGBTQ plus smoking. And again, the video may be choppy, but I hope the audio works. I started smoking really young. I've been a smoker since I was 14 years old and I'm 40 now. I come from a really small town, but once I went to college, well, there were other gay people there and they all smoked. By the time I was smart enough to realize what was going on, well, I was already addicted. It's even damaged the relationship between my non-smoking partner and I. In America right now, one in five people are smoking. In the lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender communities, we have smoking rates that are almost 70% higher than the general population. And why such extremely high smoking rates? In the LGBT communities, the stigma that we experience can nudge anybody towards unhealthy behaviors. Coming out and not knowing what my life was going to be like, you know, I smoked a pack of cigarettes every day easy to fall into the trap of smoking. So many LGBT people are already so stressed out about coming out or just living their daily lives. You experience the isolation from your family, from school members, you're looking for social acceptance. Add to that the additional stressors of being discriminated against or having your rights denied because of who you are and who you love. And I think that's what's been capitalized off of. You're not normal here have a way to relieve that stress. We're targeted by the tobacco industry because we're 
a very easy population to sell to, and we pay them back in decades and decades and decades of handsome profits to their bottom line. Because it looks like they care about us because they're sponsoring our events and they're running ads in our magazines, um, and it's a lie. Smoking is everywhere. It's part of the fabric of our communities. It's also the number one preventable health problem that we can steer clear of. We all have a role to play in, in being activated for health justice. And it's gonna take a lot of work at a lot of different levels. First step is we need to help the LGBT communities realize we have this huge smoking disparity. And knowledge can kind of strike the match, but in order to keep the flame going, there has to be support mechanisms within the community. Part of this solution is gonna be our own community members standing up and demanding to be included in health programs that are working on tobacco. As a smoker, tobacco makes a lot of the decisions for me. I don't wanna to have to feel like I have to go and smoke because smoking has that control. I wanna be able to say, I, I can do what I want. I have now been smoke free for about 15 years. Quitting smoking was incredibly liberating. It's time to make a change and save our community and save our own lives. I've spent 26 years listening to nicotine instead of myself. Yeah, it's time to quit. And so I mentioned that I'm a primary care provider in Stanford's LGBTQ plus health clinic. And I have, you know, lots of folks who smoke and lots of folks that, uh, you know, that we're working on trying to get them to, to stop smoking. And so this is, I, I think, a real, a real, um, a real disparity that exists. We do know that um, lesbian and gay people are more than twice as likely to have uh, severe either alcohol use disorder or tobacco use disorder. Um, and uh, there's lots of disparities among the bisexual community as well, including use of, uh, of substance use disorder more than three times, uh, oftentimes more than the, than the lesbian or gay community. And then, uh, and that also includes folks who are who are questioning their their current sexual identity. Um, we do know uh, data from transgender students. Uh, so these are folks who are younger, but are more than uh, are you know several times likely more likely to use um, meth and cocaine compared to their compared to their cisgender peers. And when we look at the opioid uh, crisis in this country, we continue to see um, among. Uh, Folks who are sexual minorities, the dark green bars can compared to sexual majority, the straight people uh, in the light green bars, um, that um, you know that there's uh, large amounts of people who uh, are misusing uh, prescription pain relievers um, in the United States. So this is some of the beginnings of, of course, the opioid crisis. <laughs> Um, several other health disparities that we that we have are that um, this is a very sobering statistic that 41% of transgender people have reported uh, having attempted suicide in the past compared to 1.6% of the general population. And again, this is due to societal stigma and discrimination that leads to uh, poor mental health outcomes, uh, especially among gender minority people. And this is, you know, something that I think about um, uh, every day uh, with with my folks uh, that I take care of and, and that many of my colleagues do as well. We also know that there are many other disparities, including homeless youth. Uh, youth are kicked out of their house because they're LGBT or they decide to leave their house uh, for their own safety. And so of the homeless uh, youth in this country, about 40% of them are LGBT. In San Francisco, it's actually greater than 50% of the youth that are homeless identify as LGBTQ uh, compared to say seven or so percent of the general population. So clearly a disparity there. And then, you know, many of you are researchers on this on this call. Um, and, you know, uh, about five years ago now, the NIH actually designated uh, sexual and gender minority populations as a health disparity population for research. Those of us that have been doing this work for a long time know that that was truly, uh, like, it was like kind of a, 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 a no brainer for us. Um, but we're glad that this happened because this uh, opened up uh, new funding sources and new priorities for the for the National Institutes of Health to help um, to help uh, tackle some of the the health disparities that exist in the LGBT community. So we've been delighted over the past years that this 
has been uh, has happened. And of course, you know, one of the large issues here that I wanted to mention is that we don't know a lot about LGBT people and their demographics. I presented data from Gallup, uh, a polling company, right, that calls people randomly. And part of that is because we don't collect sexual orientation and gender identity in a unified way by the federal government, like the census, which happens every 10 years. In the intervening years, the Census Bureau, the group of the, of the, organiz of the, of the country that does uh, that runs the census, they do a survey called the American Community Survey in those in those intervening years. Um, and sexual orientation and gender identity were actually removed from uh, the 2020 census in the prior uh, administration. Um, and so they were originally supposed to be collected in 2020, but they're not. So we don't know where LGBT people live. We don't know their ages. We don't know their races and ethnicities. We don't know their, um, you know, their religions. We don't know socioeconomic status. We don't know much about them. And so uh, so that's really, you know, a challenge um, because uh, many of the other federal studies, epidemiologic studies that get done, uh, rely on census data to help uh, to help do the sampling. So this is really a large a large problem, um, and so we're stuck with uh, you know with some of the the best estimates that we can get from Gallup or or other places that that do that on a population basis. So for this section. Uh, I just wanted to show that obviously LGBTQ plus people are everywhere. We are of all ages, races, ethnicities, education levels, et cetera. We face a variety of health and healthcare disparities, some of which I presented here. And unfortunately, we tend to be rather invisible in many federal health studies and longitudinal studies um, because uh, of either legislation or um, being, you know, actively removed from, from being included. So um, I wanted to pivot to about creating welcoming spaces, which is, I think, what all of you can do, both in your, in your research worlds or in your clinical worlds, um, and some of the reasons to do, to do that. I'm not going to go through this uh, in detail, but this is data from the uh, youth risk factor surveillance system, um, risk behavioral surveillance system. And um, this is looking at bullying among LGBT uh, youth and uh, as well as, you know, threatened or uh, uh, and suicide attempts. And so you can see that compared to straight and cisgender youth in a lot of these statistics, um, LGBT people are facing a lot of stigma and discrimination in a variety, a variety of places. Um, we do know, as I mentioned, that uh, that uh, folks um, who are um, who are transgender ha or gender minority people have um, uh, have more uh, attempted suicide than folks um, who are not, and we believe that this is partially due to what's called the minority stress model. And so, this is a model where people have experienced uh, discrimination, rejection, victimization, and so they begin to have. Um, what sometimes is called internalized homophobia or internalized transphobia, where they're, um, you know, again blaming themselves for for the for the discrimination that they've received, and so they begin to have negative expectations. You start to expect to be discriminated against, expect to be stigmatized. Um, that can result in concealment of people's identities and can result in poor physical and mental health outcomes. There, are, of course, are a variety of factors like having pride in who you are and being connected to a broader community that it can help um, provide some, some resilience uh, to, to, to their people's experience. <laughs> Um, this is a percentage, this chart um, shows with blue being, dark blue being the less, uh, the lowest amount and red being the highest amount of, um, of uh, percentage of people who in, in have endorsed conversion therapy or attempts to change one's gender identity from transgender to cisgender. And so you can see that there are, um, you know, large numbers across the country of folks who are actually uh, endorsing these types of behaviors or these experiences. And we know that for folks who, uh, this is of transgender adults who had, uh, were exposed to gender identity conversion uh, therapy before age 10, um, that they have clearly an increased odds um, uh, of, of past uh, year suicidal ideation, suicidal ide ideation with a plan, and lifetime suicide attempts. So these are data that are pretty, uh, are pretty clear done by um, uh, Jack Turbin in the Department of Psychiatry uh, here at Stanford. Um, and there are, you know, a variety of conversion therapy laws. So again, the dark green states here have 
have uh, laws that are outlawing that make it illegal to do conversion uh, therapy, uh, as it has been shown to do not be nothing uh, but harmful to people. <laughs> And then among transgender youth, we do know that, uh, that uh, trans youth uh, who are supported uh, have the same rates of depression, anxiety, and suicide as their peers and siblings. So again, this is society that's causing uh, the increased amounts of suicide attempts uh, and poor mental health outcomes. And, um, and also that folks had no regrets about their decision to transition uh, in, in adolescence. So this is uh, you know, one, one important aspect. Um, I also like to share uh, that this is a study of transgender and non-binary youth who were aged 15 to 21. So folks that are working in pediatric uh, populations as part of your, your research jobs, um, that using people's name correctly, the name that they want you to use uh, saves people's lives is the short answer. Um, lower suicide depression, lower, su uh, lower depression, lower su su uh, suicidal ideation, and lower suicidal behavior. Um, and they were um, lowest um, when, um, when, it when the chosen name, the name that people want to use was used in home, school, work, and with friends. So it was measured in these four different contexts or four different locations. What name to use at home, what name to use at school, what name to use at work, et cetera. And if it was used in all four places, that resulted in the lowest amount of these negative, uh, negative health outcomes. <laughs> all right. So I want to, um, I think, hearken uh, back to some of the, you know, the negative experiences that LGBTQ plus people have had in healthcare that have had inside the walls of healthcare centers and medical centers like Stanford and many others. And we need to think about ways to create a welcoming environment. And so I hope that this is some of the things that, that you'll be able to implement um, in your work and in your, your daily lives. Some of these things are very easy uh, to do and are um, you know, kind of our low lifts, but have, have, uh, have uh, large effects. So we're gonna talk about um, you know, using people's chosen name. I think I mentioned a little bit already, but also thinking about, about pronouns, which people are becoming more and more familiar with. If, you're a, if you happen to be a hiring manager on this call, think about ways that you can hire LGBTQ staff onto your teams. We'll talk about avoiding assumptions, but these are some of the other things that I think are really important in creating a welcoming environment, which is like, you know, don't ask questions out of your own curiosity. And of course, um, you know, uh, apologize quickly uh, for any mistakes that you make. I do this, uh, you know, professionally for my job. I make mistakes all the time and apologize every day for mistakes that, 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 that I make as well. So we're all, all learning and an apology does really go, uh, go a long way. So pronouns, uh, you know, folks, I think you know what they are, but we use them every day to refer to others. I have them in parentheses in my, in my Zoom name here. Um, some of the most common pronoun sets are he and him or she and her, but some folks go by um, a, a, a non, really a non-gendered one that doesn't have a typical masculine or feminine connotation, then that person's pronoun set could be they and them. And um, there are also people who don't use pronouns at all, but instead just use their name. So instead of when is his birthday, you would say, when is Mitch's birthday? If you were asking somebody when, when, when my birthday was. It is important to note that pronouns Pronouns are not the same as gender. So just because I use he and him pronouns doesn't mean that I identify as a man. And so uh, it's important to separate those, those out. Commonly, they, they go together, um, but not always. And so it's always important to think about that. Uh, it is uh, critical, critical, critical to develop systems such that you can use the person's name and pronouns that they would like you to use. The system that you use should shift. You should not force your research participant or your patient to just deal with it because Epic or whatever system you're you're using uh, doesn't uh, you know allow um, uh, to collect all the information that you need. So um, I think that those are you know some of the aspects to think about. There are ways to communicate your own pronouns, which are um, these pronoun labels that can actually go on your Stanford Medicine badge. Um, they, you know, hang down at the bottom of the badge and can show what your pronouns are or are at the top or there's buttons or pins or other other ways. Um, and then I'd like to share one thing that um, is another way that this can happen in 
in the clinical setting, um, which is using uh, pronoun stickers. I'm going to share a video um, uh, from uh, that's used in uh, a community health center in um, in in New York City uh, for how they handle it when patients or research participants actually come to their to their uh, to their location. Alan Lord strives to be a welcoming environment for all. Using the correct pronoun has the power to change the game and is a step towards creating a supportive and respectful atmosphere. Her. Z. They. She. Them. My pronouns are he, him, and his. And she, her, and hers. Pronouns matter because people matter. Pronouns are as diverse as our community. Pronouns are as fluid as gender and sexual orientation. Today, my pronoun is they. Tomorrow, it could be different, and it's who I am. The Pronouns Matter campaign is one step Cabin Nord is taking to continue improving the environment for all of our patients and to help get the word out that pronouns matter. Her. Him. She. Hers. He. My pronouns are she, her, and hers, and they them and theirs. Using a person's correct pronoun is a sign of respect. Everyone deserves to be respected. Everyone deserves to matter. Employees wear buttons to help people around them use the correct pronouns. Now, patients can use pronoun stickers to make sure people are using the correct pronouns. So, the next time you're a lord, grab a sticker and tell us your pronoun. Let the world know that your pronouns matter and show people that they matter by using their correct pronouns. Because pronouns matter. Pronouns matter. Pronouns matter. Pronouns matter. Pronouns matter. And I matter. So depending on your clinical research setting, this is something that you could implement, uh, you know, in your in your own in your own space uh, for allowing people when they're checking in to grab a pronoun sticker. Uh, some of them, like these at Count Lord, have a blank where people can just write them in. They also have stickers that are pre pre written with what pronouns, and people can just grab the one that they're wearing at, or that they are at, that they use and put them and put them on. So. Um, you know, one way that I handle uh, this in a clinical research setting is, you know, I'll thank the patient for coming in today, the research participant. My name is Mitch. I'll be helping you with enrollment today or whatever study procedure it is. I use the pronouns he, him, and his. Which pronouns do you use? That's another way to ask it just, just directly. Some people might not be comfortable sharing their pronouns, and that's okay. And some people might not even understand what you're what you're asking, and that's also okay. And so you can try to explain it, or just move on. Um, and, you know, and you know, kind of say, "Is it all right if I call you if I refer to you as she in and her in the medical record or in the documentation that we're doing for today's visit?" Uh, if they're not uh, if they're not sure what you're asking. Um, Again, pronoun stickers, uh, as Siggy mentioned in the chat, are also available at the at the the, the badging office, at the security office, where they uh, create your badges. Um, but there's also buttons or stickers that you can get from a variety of places, uh, or um, uh, you know that are sold online. Um, I include my pronouns in my email signature, for example. I include them in meetings, and uh, you know, like on my Zoom name here, it's an important thing to to really share everywhere because it signals uh, that you're. Um, you know, thinking about these issues and that they are actually indeed important and you want people to refer to you correctly. Um, and, uh, and you want, of course, want to be able to refer to other people correctly as well. <laughs> For folks that are hiring managers on the call, I would invite you um, to think about how you can hire LGBTQ staff uh, as well, um, uh, because um, many folks resonate with seeing people that are members of their own community as part of their as on the on the teams. Um, obviously, you can't explicitly ask about a person's sexual orientation or gender identity in the hiring process, but you can assess their experience working with various underserved communities. Um, you you know, and emphasize an importance in working with communities that have may have been uh, neglected or uh, minoritized or oppressed, um, and get that information both in interview questions, but also in, uh, uh, but also in, um, 
uh, uh, their cover letter or their resume looking at, at their experiences. So, um, so, and then some common assumptions, of course, are that not everybody uh, looks like or has a name that you think matches their gender identity, uh, and, and that's fine. Not every patient or participant has a, has a partner, and also don't assume the gender of the partners based on the gender of the, of the patient, right? So um, that's important. Not everybody has uh, um, a stable sexual orientation, so to speak, when I was, uh, you know, 14. I didn't know what my sexual orientation was and, uh, and that my sexual orientation has changed uh, various times over the course of my, of my life. And it's important to also note that every gender minority person has not nor is necessarily planning to undergo medical, surgical, or social transition, uh, the different types of transitioning that we discussed, that we discussed earlier. <laughs> Um, some things to avoid is that um, the, the word transgender is an adjective. It's not a noun. So uh, I, it's not she is a transgender or he is a transgender. It is she is a transgender man uh, or transgender woman. He's a transgender man. She's a transgender girl, etc. cetera. Um, also, somebody doesn't become transgendered. Uh, it is, uh, again, a transgender is an adjective, not a verb. So they are, they are not the transgendered people. Uh, so just important uh, language that can um, show that you know uh, what's going on and that you're trying to be welcoming and affirming. Um, again, don't use pronouns that you think somebody uses based on their appearance. Instead, I would encourage you uh, to ask them in a one-on-one -on -one way. Um, and I would also avoid um, exclamations of surprise. So the, you know, oh, my cousin is gay too, or I have a, a nephew who's, who's transgender. Like those are, those are not um, uh, particularly useful because they um, make it more about you than about the research participant or the patient that you're, that you're interacting with. There are some things to do, which is to inform them if your research uh, study or research practice or your clinical practice has specific efforts to ensure that people are welcomed. I would um, always be there for folks who may be struggling with their identity. Um, you know, as we talk about adding sexual orientation and gender identity questions into your research projects, this may be uh, the first time that they've been asked that in a medical setting, and they may actually, um, you may be one of the first people that they come out to. Um, and so those are important things to, to be aware of and that you may be um, you know, part of that. And so thinking about ways to, to know which resources are, are available. And then um, you know, recognizing that there's obviously a, a sensitive nature to all of this and that, um, that some of these things may come up in, in the various interactions uh, that happen. Um, and again, I mentioned that patients may, or research participants may be out to you, but they may not be out to their parents if you're dealing with a pediatric population or if you're dealing with an adult population and for that matter. And they may, um, they may actually disclose a gender identity to you that is different from the way that they, uh, that you that they appear than their gender expression. So those are all important things um, for you to think about and for ways that that, that can be um, can be can be handled. Creating a welcoming physical environment is also important. Um, in our waiting rooms and in our spaces, we sometimes have very gendered magazines or brochures, brochures that show um, a cisgender couple, for example, and don't show, um, uh, you know, a, uh, a cisgender heterosexual couple and don't show, you know, uh, uh, a, a, same, a same gender couple, for example, um, various images and things like that. So these are some of the things that we're gonna, gonna talk about. So I would take a look around your waiting rooms and your artwork and everything that's available. And do you have people of, you know, images of LGBT people that are, that are in your spaces? And if not, thinking about ways that things can things can be changed. Um, I would also show that you know there are a variety of LGBTQ symbols that exist. I've shown some of the flags in the earlier pages, and here are some more here. There are many, many more of them. You can see my Stanford Medicine badge at the bottom has the what's called the progress flag. The, it's a lapel pin, kind of in the upper left-hand corner, has the rainbow sticker. 
at the bottom. Um, and there's, you know, a variety of these ways that symbolize that you uh, are a welcoming and affirming person to, uh, to chat with. Um, these can be, um, you know, on your front desk and your check in desk as well, or in, in various places. Um, I know that, you know, as an LGBTQ plus person, I go to a business, I live in San Francisco, and even going to a business, and I see a little rainbow sticker near the cash register or on the front door or something like that. Those things are things that I definitely notice, uh, you know, like every time that I'm going into to a company. Uh, and so they are uh, symbols that I think really resonate with many members, uh, obviously not all, but with many members uh, of, our, of our community. Um, I would also encourage people to look at the bathroom situation uh, in your spaces. And if you have uh, single single person occupancy bathrooms that are currently gendered, where they're, uh, you know, there's only one toilet in them, only one person can be in them at a time, and they're listed as uh, male or you know for men or women, think about changing them with a simply a new sign <laughs> that uh, is something like this that these are all gender restrooms. Uh, there's a variety of efforts across the campus, across the university campus, to change. Uh, uh, restrooms uh, where where they can be changed, um, and there's a variety of ways even to do this, even for for multi person um, for multi person bathrooms um, to get these changed um, changed over. And I'm happy to talk with folks if you have uh, if you're in charge of the space in your particular your particular area. Um, um, so and. Uh, some of that is taking, of course, a long time to change across across the, the medical center and across the campus. Uh, so next is culturally competent forms. Uh, you know, many of you use forms to gather information from folks. Um, and so using, uh, I would recommend to avoid using gendered uh, terms where possible, but include forms that are going to, items that are going to help you interact better with your research participant. Which name do you go by? Which name would you like us to use? What are your pronouns? You can get this all on the kind of an intake form at the beginning. And, you know, how would you, what name would you like us to refer to you today? Um, using blanks wherever possible, instead of check boxes, not putting people into a box, but letting them label, use their own words. And then thinking about how you should document this. Some people may keep research records in, in Epic, other people have their own systems or own case report forms. Some people are still on paper. Some people are using uh, research uh, reporting systems, um, you know, Encore and others. Others are using systems that are designed by the by the sponsor or by a by a by a CRO. And so thinking about, you know, are there places in those in those existing systems to collect the information that you can better um, you know, uh, create a better experience for a research participant coming in so that the next time, you know, Mitch comes in, you call him by Mitch and you use the right pronouns uh, rather than what name may be on a driver's license or name that may be in a record. Um, and sometimes that actually requires creating a little bit of a shadow file where you have people's, uh, you know, uh, maybe their participant ID number and what name you should call them and their, and their, um, and which pronouns uh, they use. Of course, making sure that that gets appropriately uh, protected in terms of uh, data security and privacy. And then um, it is important to ask about whether or not you want to, um, whether they're out to people. What name should I use when I need to call you? Is that different than the name that we're gonna use when you're here in person? Because they may not uh, be out to the people they live with. And so you're calling them at home asking and referring them uh, but to them by a name that they may not necessarily use. So those are some of the special considerations that may need to be to be documented and things to think about when you're when you're interacting with folks. And similarly, a telephone conversation is oftentimes even harder than an in-person conversation because there's no forms to collect information. Uh, it's you asking the questions um, and there's no body language. So you can't see if they're upset or maybe anxious about the question that you uh, have just have just asked. So um, and again, caution to not inadvertently out uh, the, the patient or the participant to other people uh, on the on the telephone. And again, it's really important to uh, to recognize uh, mistakes and to apologize for them for them quickly. One of the ways to help with the telephone environment is to use pre-written scripts for many of your interactions. And so this is a way that you can ask 
uh, what name would you like us to call you when you're coming into the clinic or what name would you like us to use when we're calling you on the phone? Um, which pronouns do you use, et cetera? Uh, and it maybe makes you more comfortable because it's something that you can read over the phone um, and it allows you to get a little bit of practice um, uh, and is oftentimes a little easier than an in-person interaction when you're just reading something uh, and, and getting a little bit more comfortable asking some of these questions. So for this section, um, you know, there are um, uh, obviously some interactions that are needed by thinking about how you can sensitively ask questions and when it's appropriate to do so that you can then use the answers, uh, which is somebody's name and their pronouns to treat people with respect when they come in for clinical research visits or when you're calling them for follow up. Um, it's important not to make assumptions about people's names, about people's pronouns that they use, about what their gender is, about uh, based on you know, what their gender identity is, based on their gender expression, et cetera. And that adding physical symbols of the LGBTQ plus communities can actually help signal uh, both a welcoming environment in your, in your physical space, but also uh, that you're a welcoming and affirming person based on some of the, the symbols that you may wear on your, on your badge. And of course, telephone, as we just discussed, can be, can be, can be difficult. So in this next section, um, we have a couple scenarios and I would invite people to either in the chat or just to come off mute is even, even ideal here um, to see, uh, to really just state what was wrong or what assumption was made in each of these scenarios. There are lots of them are pretty obvious. And so I would, uh, would just invite people to, 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 to look at them. So this first one is Aria arrives for her urgent care appointment and appreciates when the assistant at the front desk asks her what name she goes by and her pronouns, which she told them. But she's disappointed later when the nurse part practitioner asked her if she has a boyfriend while taking a sexual history. So what is what is what what happened in this particular scenario that made her disappointed? And I've gotten one comment that her sexual orientation is being assumed and assuming sexuality based on her gender identity. Excellent, right. So that's what's happening here, right? She's, they're basically assuming that because her name is Aria, because she's using uh, she and her pronouns that her that her uh, that she must be straight and that she must have a boyfriend uh, and you know, and maybe that that she only has one partner instead of maybe multiple partners. So there's multiple assumptions that were made here instead of asking perhaps a more a more open-ended question you know which is could be something like um you know do you have a partner are you uh tell me about the genders of the people that you have sex with etc uh do you live with anybody all these things can start to open up some conversation about uh about somebody's sexual history let's move on to this next one this is selena who's a transgender woman who has an infection in her hand and uh, the nurse has never taken care of a transgender person before and finds himself very curious about Selena. And then he repeatedly catches himself staring at her and while taking Selena's vitals, he asks, you know, at first I thought you were a real woman. You don't take hormones or, or do you take hormones? Have you had the surgery yet? And Selena responds uh, angrily. I don't think that this has anything to do with my hand. Uh, what happened in this particular case? So great, great comments, which is that the, the nurse is uh, prioritizing himself and his curiosity over, over the patient uh, and that yeah, using clearly offensive language like real woman uh, and that in fact she is indeed a woman because it is as, as, as Dom pointed out defined by, by her identity and not by her anatomy. Um, and you know, assuming that surgery is needed, many other implications uh, and things that are clearly as as uh, as Nisha said, invalidating, being rude, um, and lots of uh, again assuming that there also it has to be uh, these various steps of transitioning hormones and surgery and everything. This was uh, an incredibly offensive uh, encounter that unfortunately. 
only happens, uh, you know, over and over again um, in in across the country, including including unfortunately at Stanford. Um, the next scenario is uh, is Jada, who's in uh, for a well child appointment. She arrives with her younger brother Flynn. They're shown here, uh, and their mothers. Uh, and the pediatrician sees the family, and she's a little bit confused because both mothers appear to be white, and so does Jada. But Flynn looks African American, and the pediatrician asks Jada, "Is this your friend?" And Jada responds, uh, "You know, exasperated, no, that he's my brother." So what's happening in this particular case? Yeah, thanks, Nate. There's a, assuming that there's a family relationship, uh, that this, the family relationship is based on race um, instead of uh, 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 instead of other things. Yeah, assuming that that, that Flynn isn't uh, a family uh, because he is a different race from the other folks, and so this I think is this uh, underlies a couple things. One is that. Um, that there is lots of intersectionality. So LGBTQ plus people can also be racial or ethnic minorities, as I mentioned earlier, and people have a variety, maybe members of multiple minoritized communities. And that's an important thing for people to be, to be aware of. Additionally, um, you know, there are, um, um, you know, in this case, they arrive with their with their mothers. So I'm assuming that it's uh, I'm going to make an assumption that for the purposes of this conversation, that these are two cisgender women, so two lesbian cisgender women who um, who have a family, and many folks um, make families in various ways. Um, sometimes uh, that can be um, through egg or sperm donors and can be carrying the family. It can also be through a, through surrogacy or through adoption. And so there are many ways that LGBTQ people make their family, create families. And so just really an important thing to think about that, um, um, uh, uh, that that's, uh, you know, a, a, a key aspect. And uh, Amanda, you're right that this, that, that, you know, yeah, Jada's there for their for her appointment. Flynn isn't there. Flynn just happens to be there, and he's not the focus of the appointment at all. But the pediatrician, I think, trying to be friendly, asks, uh, you know, is this your friend? Uh, and um, instead, you know, creates a um, you know kind of a, a situation that uh, that uh, has really has has really offended uh, the family, or at least offended and the Jada appropriately so. So, uh, so yeah, there's really um, just an important aspect that people make their families in various ways um, and, that, uh, and that there are uh, intersections between sexual and gender minority status and racial and ethnic minority status, of course. Um, in the fourth scenario here, uh, we have Kiara, who identifies as Latinx and bisexual, and is in the waiting room for her OBGYN appointment, and is looking uh, through some of the pamphlets, the brochures and things that are typically in our waiting rooms, and is disappointed that she sees very few uh, people of color in these pamphlets, and that all the couples are portrayed as heterosexual. So again, um, every part of, of our environment is really important. And so, you know, as you go back to work uh, or into the office, if you're in offices now or go back, uh, I don't know if you're in uh, a couple of days a week, next time you're in your research space where participants are coming through and maybe even where there's just a couple chairs for them to wait for their um, for their appointment, think about the things that are around there. Look at the walls, look at the, um, the reading materials, look at the things that are available for people and see if there are small changes that you can make um, that are assuming or that are getting rid of assumptions that everybody is straight and that everybody's heterosexual and, and that people are, are necessarily partners. So I think that those are uh, you know, some important uh, things to potentially consider. 
So, you know, why don't providers ask about sexual orientation and gender identity? And this is uh, a paper with a horrible title, but is um, really people don't ask about sexual histories generally because, um, you know, the people are, uh, their fear, or the providers don't, are, are worried that they're going to be intrusive or, you know, that they're, they're um, don't really know the clinical relevance. They don't know how to act. There may be age differences between the provider and the patient or the, the sex of the provider and the patient are different. We do know that providers who are assigned female sex at birth ask about sexual, uh, take a sexual history and ask about who people are living with and who they're having sex with more than, uh, than uh, providers who are assigned male sex at birth. And of course, sometimes there's a third party in the room, like a, a partner, a parent, a friend, etc. And so sometimes we need to get that person out of the room in order to ask those questions. We do know for sure that physicians are uncomfortable asking about this. So this, this is now many years old in uh, 1982. You know, so 40, 40 years ago, 40% uh, of the providers were sometimes or often uncomfortable providing care to gay patients. This uh, study was repeated 17 years later, um, now 23 years ago, and 20% still were uncomfortable uh, providing care to gay patients. We do know that um, that the the that if you graduated from medical school more recently, so if you graduated from medical school, school in the 2000s, for example, you were less homophobic than doctors who were who were older. So again, it's the continuing um, continuing evolution of society as well. And we do know that when you don't assume that people are in a heterosexual relationship, that people actually disclose more information about who they are and they feel more comfortable interacting with you. And they're more likely to stay in, engaged in your practice and they're more likely to stay retained in your research study. So these are some important, so these interactions that we have that seem relatively minor uh, actually create people, um, you know, to continue seeing you as a provider and to continue participation in your, in your research studies. Um, and so, you know, when we think about, um, about, uh, you know, uh, how to ask about sexual orientation and gender identity, there's a variety of ways to do this. And it really all depends on your particular, particular environment, particular research study, et cetera. And so again, we wanna hearken back to the, all the components of the gender unicorn as a way to think about it. And if you ever get confused about sex and gender, I tend to use this, uh, this little cute phrase, which is sex is what's in your genes. And that can be the jeans, like the pants that you wear. Uh, and gender identity is what's between your ears. So that's one way to, to try to remember, um, to remember the difference between sex and gender if you get confused uh, about it. But, you know, there are a variety of ways to ask. We've talked about forms. We've talked about telephones. We've talked about, uh, a variety, you know, various questionnaires that can be given both in person or beforehand. In some cases, people can enter information directly into the medical record through My Health uh, online, depending on what questionnaires you're, you're sending out that way. When you do ask, though, uh, it is important um, that people may, uh, these questions may come up depending on where this is being documented. So if this is being documented in a standard place in EPIC as part of somebody's medical record, even though they're in a research study, um, that um, sometimes they might not necessarily want that to be included in their medical record because that you, uh, you basically can't ensure confidentiality of that record uh, because it might be sent to another facility. And so these are important clarifications to ask with the, with the patient, with the research participant. Um, can I document this here or can I keep this in another, in another place so that I know more about you, but I don't want, but they might not want it shared um, in various places. Um, and of course, there's no real correct way to ask. Um, I've only provided some examples, but the key things are to make assumptions. And it just doesn't need to be asked um, depending, it depends on the setting, right? If somebody is critically ill in the ICU, you're probably not going to devote a huge amount of effort to figuring out their sexual orientation. You may devote some effort to figuring out who they live with, who's their support system, who's going to be help, who's going to be able to consent for that person. Um, and so thinking more on how you can be welcoming and affirming when they may have, um, you know, a, a, same, a same sex or same gender partner, for example. 
Um, you know, in my in my practice and in, in various settings, you know, I depending on what somebody's meeting me for, I can say that I, you know, I talk to my patients about their gender identity. Some people don't know what what you may mean by that. And so I can sometimes use the word, like sometimes people feel like their physical bodies don't match the gender with which they most identify. Um, and that knowing your gender identity helps me care for you. And I oftentimes will introduce myself, you know, hi, my name is Mitch. I'm a primary care provider here in Los Altos. I use he and him pronouns. What pronouns do you use at my, at my like very, very, very first visit uh, with, uh, with folks? And then, um, you know, and then that get, can get documented in, um, in a variety of, of places um, if it's okay uh, with, the, with the participant. Um, there's a few slides here just to more about pronouns um, as well as, um, uh, as the grammar police that I mentioned earlier that things are, you know, uh, it's an adjective, <laughs> et cetera. Um, and I think the key thing is to always think about the language that you're using. So using gender neutral language is really an important thing. Tell me a little bit about your living situation. Tell me a little bit more about the people you live with. Tell me about your partners. Are you in a relationship that's sexual? Uh, what are the genders of your partners that you're having sex with? Those sorts of those sorts of questions, rather than assuming that somebody has a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a husband or a wife, and that they may and they may actually people may actually have more than one partner as well. And so those are important things um, to think about. Um, sometimes getting into these questions can be a little bit difficult, and so. I, um, you know, depending on your workflow, depending on the study and depending on what are the order of questions that you're asking, you know, I say, you know, just like the questions that I asked before that might be about tobacco or things that we ask everybody, I also, I also ask everybody about their sexual health and sexual identity. And that's kind of a, a way to normalize that you're not targeting somebody with these specific questions just for some other reason, but it's actually things that you do uh, do for everybody. Um, you know, uh, ask if you're having sex with people, are you sexually active, uh, you know, are some possible ways, uh, be careful with sexually active. I got one patient who, who said, no, I just lie there, uh, which I thought was, uh, which was cute. Um, but there are really a variety of um, ways to ask. And again, because um, people, there are more genders than just man and woman, right? The, the previous question that we used to ask of, are your partners man, men, women, or both? Oftentimes we've now replaced that with, tell me more about the genders of your sexual partners. Um, and that's a way to, 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 to move into that. Um, in the last section, I wanted to um, talk a little bit about some of the logistics about how you can, can actually do this. There are a variety of questions and I'm happy to provide questions that people can implement in their own research studies or own intake forms. Um, this, these are, this is just one possible example of questions that you could ask. Um, to in, a, in an initial visit uh, for a research study or for a clinical uh, space um, for um, ways to collect some of this information that can help you, uh, that, you, could, how you that can help you uh, move forward. A lot of folks also use a color coding system, um, which is <laughs> a way to make sure that you're using the right pronouns for people. So you can put a little sticker on a paper chart or have a color coding system in an electronic way um, to show which pronouns people use um, is, is, is one way to, 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 um, to, to, to make sure that that happens correctly. And then, <coughs> excuse me, um, also making sure that you assess what name you would like them to use, to use um, in the visit. And if you're in a visit where insurance is being billed, then you can make sure that you have the correct information for insurance billing. But for a lot of research studies, some of that is probably not particularly necessary. And instead you can just refer to people by the name that, that, they, that they would use. Um, so I'm gonna show a couple scenarios here. Um, um, it's a variety of scenarios, both with adults um, and pediatrics. So they know that folks may be um, doing pediatric based work as well. Um, and these scenarios oftentimes have a good experience followed by, or a, a negative experience followed by a, a, a revisited experience that's a little more positive. So again, I hope these videos work. Uh, I hope the audio at least works even if the video is a little choppy.
The doctor will be able to take you in a few minutes. In the meantime, if you could please fill out those forms and then return them back to me. Great, thank you. No problem. Um, excuse me? Yes, how can I help you? I don't really understand why it's asking me about sexual orientation. Oh, well, I don't know either, but it's required, so just write something down. Okay. In this scene, the registration assistant appeared uncomfortable with the patient's question. Rather than providing information about sexual orientation and its relevance to patient health, she told the patient to just write something down. The next scene will show a more effective way to respond to the patient's question. Hi. Hi. The doctor will be able to take you in a few minutes, and in the meantime, could you please fill out these forms and then return them back to me? Great, thank you. No problem. Um, excuse me? Yes, how can I help you? I don't really understand why it's asking me about sexual orientation. These are new questions for all of our patients that are important for healthcare. Here's a brochure with more information, and you can discuss this more with your provider who will welcome your questions. Okay, great. Thank you, I'll talk to my doctor. No problem. In this scene, the registration assistant helped the patient by providing an informational brochure and by suggesting a discussion with the provider. She made eye contact with the patient, spoke without embarrassment, and mentioned that the question was being asked of all patients. So I think this highlights the importance of doing this in a really uniform way of uh, asking it to everybody, normalizing it. There are a variety of resources that, that I have. I can get you connected to uh, for uh, for brochures like this brochure that she ended up giving to the patient those exist in real life about why about why um, this collecting this information is is important in in clinical research and in clinical practice uh, next uh, relates to a transgender person who has um, who uses a different name Hey, how are you? Good. My name is Camille Murray. Uh, sure. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not showing you in our system. Are you sure you have an appointment today? Yes, I even got a reminder call. Uh, that's weird. Um, uh, hey, Jeanette. Hey. Hi, uh, I have a patient here that says she has an appointment today, but I can't seem to find her in our system. All right, let me take a look. Sure. Never mind. Look under Charles Murray. That was my previous name a year ago. I changed it, but I guess it was never updated here. I'm sorry, did you say Charles? Yes, Charles. Oh, um, I see. Um. In this scene, the registration assistant was not prepared to act respectfully with a transgendered patient. He showed surprise when he heard the patient's previous name was Charles. He also used inconsiderate body language when speaking to his colleague. The next scene will show a more effective and respectful interaction between the registration assistant and the patient. Hey, how are you? Good. I'm Kumail Murray. Oh, sure. Um, I'm sorry, we're not showing a Camille in our system. Um, might your record be under a different name? Uh, yeah, it should be under Charles Murray. Uh, yeah, sure. Okay, I am showing a Charles Murray. Uh, could I just grab your date of birth so I can verify I have the correct record? Sure, it's November 20th, 1990. Okay, all right. Uh, I apologize for not having your name updated in our records. Um, we just started adding additional name and pronoun information, and it's just taking us a little bit of time to make sure we get everything up to date. Uh, that's fine. I thought I would have to keep explaining to people. I, I can't promise there won't be a few more mistakes, but we're definitely doing everything we can to make sure we get it right, and we should have everything running smoothly soon. Okay, thank you so much. Of course. In this scene, the registration assistant did several things well. First, he recognized that the patient's records may be under a different name. Second, he confirmed the patient's birth date to ensure that he had pulled up the correct record. And finally, he apologized for the mistake in the system and explained how the health center is working to fix it. 
So I think, you know, again, this is an example of the systems changing rather than us making the patient change, right? Figuring out the systems, making sure that we uh, continue to improve them uh, and advance, uh, you know, whoever we need to in the health system to, to make things, to make things uh, happen correctly. So the next one is, um, is uh, a pediatric patient uh, and, uh, and their mom. Hey, how are you doing? Hello. I'm here for my child's appointment. The name is S. Souza. Sure. Can I get the date of birth? August 12, 2008. Very great. So I just have a few forms for you to fill out um, before we take in, um, but feel free to take a seat and bring them back when you're done. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. No so while mom is filling this out, you'll maybe note that she puts a question mark next to female and writes in uh, she, her, and he, him as pronouns in this form. So, Sasha, I want to ask you a few more questions, okay? Okay. Can you tell me, do you feel like a boy or a girl or both or something else? There's no right answer. She keeps telling me she's a boy, and she doesn't like girl stuff, so we let her go by the name Sasha. And I like it because it could be either for a boy or a girl. But I don't know. I, I think she might just be a tomboy, and she wants to be like her big brother. Mom, I am a boy. Sorry, honey. It's just hard for me to understand. Thank you for sharing that. I do want to ask Sasha. What do you say, Sasha? I'm a boy. And how long have you known you're a boy? I don't know, a long time. And Sasha, when we talk about you, do you want us to call you he or she? He. Thank you, Sasha. In this scene, the registration form provided an opportunity for the parent to share information about her child's gender identity and pronouns. This information was then used by the clinician to ask appropriate, respectful follow-up questions about the child's gender identity and pronouns. So again, this really emphasizes the power of forms to collect information and to kind of be the, the foray into having, you know, kind of breaks the ice a little bit about having a discussion about gender identity and pronouns. And it can happen both in the adult setting or in this case, in the pediatric setting. So I think both of those um, examples uh, would apply. Um, next is an adolescent patient. So Lily, I'm going to ask you some questions about how you identify with your gender and your sexuality. And these are some questions that I ask all my teen patients. I won't share any of this information with your parents if you don't want me to. That's actually why I asked your mom to step outside and wait in the waiting room. However, I do need to mention that if your parents want to read what's in your medical record, they can do that. So I don't have to put anything in the record if you don't want me to. Just say so, okay? Okay. So the first question that I'm going to ask you is, do you think of yourself as a girl, a boy, transgender, genderqueer, or another gender? Actually, I've never really felt like a boy or a girl. I'm just me. Sometimes people think I'm a boy, but it never bothers me. That's great that you feel comfortable with who you are. Thanks. You don't need to make a decision right now about your gender, but I'd like to put a note in your record so that the next time that you come in, I can remember. Would you be okay with that? Sure, that would be fine. Great. I can put gender as other for now, which simply means that you don't identify with any of the other categories that we have in our system. Do you agree with that, or would you consider yourself male? Female, transgender, or genderqueer? Yeah, other is good. Maybe I'll change my mind the next time I see you. That's totally fine. We can talk a little bit more about it now if you like. Sure, that would be great. In this scene, the clinician did several things well. First, she politely asked the adolescent patient's parent to leave the room so she can have a private conversation with the patient. Second, she made sure the patient knew that although their conversation is confidential, any information in the medical record could be read by a parent. 
She also asked the patient for permission to put the information in the medical record. Finally, the clinician was supportive and affirming with the patient. So in this case, again, it's the importance of disclosing that, uh, you know, that the the provider or the research assistant isn't going to share information with the with the parent uh, after you get the parent out of the room to have some of these conversations if it's appropriate for the research study that you're doing. Uh, at the same point, um, the reason the parent is oftentimes able to access those records uh, at some point. So thinking about whether it should be recorded there or not is is an important one. Um, the next scenario, which is the second to last scenario is uh is with a with a non-binary patient the patient has a non-binary gender identity and who uses pronouns that may be that were unfamiliar to the to to the provider hi dr russell kai's in the room i have kai's chart right here thank you Hello, Kai. How are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? I'm well, Kai. Last time we met, I recall your pronouns were he, his, him. Now, I don't want to make any assumptions. I always like to check with my patients again. What are your pronouns? Thanks for asking. They're Z, here, and here's. Okay, great. I'd like to make a note and let my other staff know. And could you spell those for me? Sure. Z-E-H-I-R-H-I-R-S. Okay, great. And please let me know if I make any mistakes. Oh, no problem. I will. In this scene, the clinician affirms the patient's gender identity by asking about any pronoun changes since the last visit. The clinician is also honest about the fact that these pronouns are unfamiliar to her, and she asks the patient to correct her if she makes a mistake. In addition, the clinician makes sure to record the pronouns in the medical record system so that the other staff members will refer to the patient correctly. Uh, and then the last scene, um, this is something that I think, you know, as you become uh, more comfortable and become supportive and welcoming and affirming of LGBT communities, we may be faced with members uh, of our team, our coworkers, et cetera, who don't, who are less supportive. And in fact, in some points may even be, um, may even be, you know, outright discriminatory or stigmatizing. And so uh, this next section um, just shows, um, you know, one of the ways in which uh, it's important to, to speak up and, and correct people. I don't understand. Is it a he or a she? I don't understand. Is it a he or a she? Excuse me, doctor. The patient you're referring to uses the pronoun she or her, not it. And we all know she deserves some respect, please. You're right. I agree. So if you or the residents have any questions about how to ask our patients about their identity, let me know. I'm a resource. We're a team. Let's do it. Let's work together. Well, thanks. I appreciate that. You're welcome. So that's, you know, 20 seconds, 30 seconds of, of uh, correcting a scenario at the time that it's happening. Um, which is, uh, you know, another key point is to happen is to address those really right at the at the moment that they're happening, in, in a way that is, um, you know, that is I think you know speaking up for the patient or the research participant, but is also um, looking forward to the future and how to how to make things make things better in the practice or in in the process. So we're reaching the end of our of our time. So I just wanted to to wrap up here with a few take home points from today's talk. I hope that you've learned that LGBTQ people are actually underserved, understudied in research and are a population that's vulnerable to various health and healthcare disparities. Um, that it's important to avoid assumptions, realize that people may have complex identities and to apologize um, for people's mistakes uh, that you may make along the way. It's important to use um, 
to use uh, LGBT appropriate symbols and language and ideally staff members um, that uh, can help people uh, to signal the desire of the practice of the research program to welcome LGBT people. It really requires efforts from all of us um, uh, to do this. And we do know that welcoming and affirming LGBT people in your in the healthcare system, including in research, does actually save lives by using people's names, by using their pronouns, et cetera. Um, and all of us, every single one of us can actually um, include uh, can do work by um, by increasing LGBTQ visibility, getting it added to our research studies, even advocating sponsors, uh, clinical research sponsors, to include sexual orientation and gender identity questions in the study, um, and collecting that even uh, in your own uh, individual processes uh, for particular investigator initiated studies, for example. Everybody. Um, can make can make that happen. So I'll be sure to put um, my email address in the chat box for everybody. Um, there's also the course evaluation that Susan um, just placed um, there. But I'm always happy to to meet one on one with people or to meet with your research study teams about ways of improving uh, things for a particular research project or research study that you're involved in, um, and, and ways to make if you're a clinician to make your um, to make your practice better. And if you're uh, a hiring manager, ways that you can incorporate some language into job descriptions uh, and other processes to, um, to, find, to help find candidates who are um, LGBT affirming, not necessarily uh, of the, their own identities, but at least are, are affirming. And I'm happy um, to take uh, questions that people can share verbally. Um, I have one question that was sent to me uh, through like a private chat message, which I'm happy to answer first, and then we can move into to questions um, from the audience that people have. And if people want to write them in the chat instead of verbally, that's also fine too. So um, the question is, um, is there a way for an individual to be seen by a PCP at an LGBT clinic without their parents known, knowing that the clinic is uh, specifically for LGBTQ folks? And if so, how? That is a great question. <laughs> um, and I'm not precisely sure, because it sounds like this would be for, for a child, since it was about their, you know, about their parents knowing. Obviously, if you're over 18, uh, you have complete control over who can see your, your medical record except of course for your insurance company but um uh but if you're under 18 um it does it can be a little bit challenging um maybe um if you want to email me i'll connect you to uh, our colleague Tan the a who's a professor in at the pediatric uh gender clinic um because uh, i don't know how they handle um how they handle that specifically. There are a variety of also LGBTQ affirming um, uh, pediatricians um, that are not necessarily at a specifically designated branded LGBTQ plus clinic, uh, but are very LGBT affirming. And so that may be another possible possible way where uh, they would go to kind of a general pediatri pediatric clinic that has been, you know, uh, uh, guided a little bit in, uh, on the back end. So with that, I'll stop sharing. And if anybody has questions, feel free to, uh, to unmute yourself. And thank you all for your attention today. Thank you, Dr. Lon. I uh, really appreciate this was very uh, informative. And uh, uh, we all hope that we can really uh, support uh, and bring these uh, back to our work that we are doing and hopefully be able to uh, do that. Just to piggyback on that question you answered, uh, wouldn't it be uh, uh, more supportive if uh, for those uh, um, young adolescents uh, that don't want to share it with their parents, wouldn't it be more supportive for them if they, the, the medical team, the provider team, educate the parents on these uh, and help them support their kids actually through this problem, through this, you know, um, identification. Yeah, um, yeah. Of, oftentimes, yes. The challenge is, is that sometimes it's, it's it's if the kid wants that, right? If the child wants, you know, they might not be out to their parents at all, right, at a certain point. And so sometimes it's a uh, that that oftentimes happens at uh, at a certain point in the 
you know, in the, in the coming out process. Right. So I have, you know, several patients who are, who are 18 and are just kind of moving from pediatrics to adults and, you know, their parents are oftentimes still heavily involved in their, um, in their, um, in their healthcare, they show up to their appointments with me and I have to kick them out. And then, you know, but sometimes, sometimes it is, uh, you know, I talk to the patient and they're, you know, they may say, you know what, my, my, mom or my dad needs a little bit of help about this because I'm just starting to, you know, I've come out to them and they need some help. And at that point, as the primary care provider, we're more than happy to jump in and talk to them about that and even get them connected to some resources within Stanford that can help them with the, with the coming to terms with their, um, you know, with their, um, with their, their child's identity, right? Because it, it's a, it's a, it's a process for the parents as well. And, um, but sometimes we get into a situation where, where the child is not at all yet ready to come out to their parents. And so there's not really, and at that point, I'm not gonna get involved in the family in the family component, right? If the patient isn't, isn't ready for that. So, so yeah. Oh, and Siggy, thanks for showing the, for sharing some information about the, about the, um, about the pride employee research group from that, from the healthcare center, from the healthcare system. Some details in the chat there for folks. Wonderful. Um, any other questions? We are at the time. So um, if there is no other question, uh, you can always feel free to email um, Dr. Lange or ours, uh, and we can forward the uh, questions to him. And uh, uh, as Dr. Lang mentioned, I put the evaluation in the chat and I will still email it to you as well with the slides and the recording. Um, I'm going to stop recording here. And uh, um, thank you all so much for being here. And thank you, Dr. Lan, for uh, this informative uh, educational uh, presentation. Um, have Absolutely. A and, rest of and, the I'll, and I'll get my slides to you right away. So thank you. <laughs> so I appreciate you have them. it. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Great. Thanks, everybody.